feel very privileged to be asked to speak at quite a few events and seminars throughout the year. And obviously what I get asked to speak about is Project Futures and the work that we do in the anti-trafficking world. But the biggest misconception of what a lot of people think that we do is that we operate orphanages in Cambodia, that we manage anti-trafficking programs here in Australia, or that I am some sort of world-renowned expert on the issue of human trafficking. Um, now, while Project Futures certainly touches um, on at least the first two of these areas, uh, what I believe that we're in the business of is inspiring, engaging and empowering young Australians and young people around the world to take action by using their everyday skills and talents to make a difference to combat human trafficking. We want to demonstrate to you that you don't have to be an expert in the non-profit world or even study a degree in international development or human rights law in order to take those everyday small steps into combating this crime against humanity. See, the Project Futures team believe that decision is the ultimate power. And whether you realise it or not, the decisions or lack of decisions that each one of you makes every single day directly affects both those people that you love and also those people that you might never meet but will ultimately benefit from your choices. So I want to kick it off today by telling you about the humble beginnings of Project Futures and how within two years of being run 100% voluntarily, we've managed to hit milestones such as raising over $400,000 for anti-trafficking programs on the ground in Cambodia and right here in Australia. We were able to harness a database of over 28,000 people, uh, supporters I should say globally, and we were able to start a Project Futures global program in New York City and Los Angeles in 2011. But what is Project Futures? Well, we are a non-profit run by passionate campaigners. We harness the skills and abilities of our network every day to raise funds and awareness for anti-trafficking projects that are already are in existence that we believe are in need of support. See, we believe that your time, skills and talents are by far your most valuable assets and we want to give you an outlet to harness those skills and talents into what is a meaningful contribution. We attract to our cause young professionals that want to leverage their everyday normal social calendar and working life to make a difference to our cause and have fun doing it, ensuring that social networking will equal social responsibility. So how did this all begin? I feel very privileged to be able to call this woman part of my family. Her name is Somali Mum, and I read her autobiography just over three years ago, three and a half years ago now. She was a Cambodian woman sold into prostitution at the age of 12. She was abused, raped and traumatised over and over for years um, and she actually ended up marrying one of the clients that used her as a prostitute and had three children with him. Now I read Somali's autobiography and was totally shocked and appalled of what I read. And it was the first time I'd ever heard about this issue of human trafficking. I mean, I heard of prostitution and all that sort of stuff, but um, forced sort of sexual servitude, I just... I don't know, I just never really been clung into my um, mind before. So I had two choices, you know, I could cry about it, which I did. I could whine to my friends about how unfair the world is, which I did. Um, but I also decided a third thing, I wanted to do something. And I believe that what happened next, I only really had three things that I believe every single one of you in this room has. I had a functioning brain. Who has a functioning brain? Put your hand up. Yep. Right. I had a passion and conviction for what I was trying to achieve, do something for the cause, and I had a don't ask, don't get attitude. So what did I do with all of these three, three things? Well, I decided to cycle through Cambodia and raise money and awareness for Somali mom and her work and get all of my friends to do it with me. So I called this the Future Zone 09 Cycle Challenge. So I set up a website through a friend. I organised, sorry, I wrote a welcome letter and... Um, an info pack with the help of more friends and I got my sporty and adventurous friends to join me. Um, and each person who wanted to come on this trip had to raise a minimum amount for the Somali Mom Foundation and they got to come on this journey. Um, and a lot of people ask me like throughout the whole process as we were sort of gaining momentum, Steph, this is amazing. Like how are you getting all of these people? How are you sort of like getting all these donations, um, and I said to them that they were like, you know, I wouldn't have the resources to do something like that. I wouldn't have the time. I don't really have the network. How do you do it? And I say to them, you know, 
When you want to get something off the ground, no matter how big or small it may be, it is not about whether you have the resources, because guys, no one has all the resources to begin with. It is about resourcefulness. So in my case, friends that didn't make a donation or didn't want to, I asked them to help me using their skills and talents. I didn't know how to create a website. I didn't have any really great photos of sort of Cambodia, what I was trying to do. Um, I had marketing skills, but you know, you need a lot more, a lot more sort of um, things to get it off the ground. So I asked them to help me and they did. Because remember, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? So what did I get? Well, 21 people came on our first cycle and we raised, collectively raised 80,000 US dollars, which two years ago was a lot of money. <laughs> um, we went to Cambodia, we cycled through this amazing country. We met Somali Mom and we visited the centres that she runs over there. That rest and what Somali does over there is a really holistic approach to these women and children. They rescue, rehabilitate and reintegrate back into society. Women and children that have been forced into the sex industry. Now, it wasn't all smooth sailing, of course, nothing is, right? But every time I had that fear of, oh my goodness, I'm going to be cycling through Cambodia by myself, and I hadn't ridden a bike in like 10 years, what am I going to do? I clung to the passion and conviction for what and who I was doing this for. Somali and the men, women and children that find themselves in absolutely exploitative and just disgusting situations, sorry, exploitative situations even today. I clung to that. And when I went to see firsthand the amazing, when I saw, sorry, firsthand the amazing work that this woman is doing over in Cambodia, vocational training skills, I'm wearing beads that the girls um, make in Cambodia through their vocational training school of sewing and, and dressmaking. I just realised that my one decision that I had made after I read Somali's book led to doing good for 250 uh, women and children that were in Somali centres at that time. That one decision that I had made to do something. And we have to all remember that you are each in charge of your own sort of destinies. We all know this. You know, if I want to do well, I can stick and focus to what I'm doing and, and I'll get there. But you can also be the catalyst of ch for change in someone else's life. So coming back from Cambodia to Australia in March 2009 was a huge turning point in my life. Uh, three months later, I registered Project Futures as a non-profit organisation um, in Sydney. And that's when the real roller coaster began. One of the biggest sort of messages that, that I sort of learnt throughout the last two years has been this. Complacency is definitely the largest form of waste. And it's so easy to get complacent or to sort of go off track. And if you don't ride that wave of momentum sort of at the right time, it's really hard to keep getting back on the board. And I just felt it was so, un like for me, to have all these advantages, all this momentum of what we were doing, all this excitement after coming back from Cambodia, all these opportunities that we have here in this amazing, amazing country, and then decide to settle for the mediocre, and then decide to defend the status quo. I mean, what a waste that is. Embracing the opportunities that you have right here in front of you is truly a gift. And if you allow it to serve someone else, you know, I obviously believe that, that um, there's more to life, obviously, in that. Um, and a sense of purpose. But I'll never forget the biggest sort of... Um, I'll never forget sort of the time where I really thought, wow, Project Futures is, is getting big. Like, it used to just be this network of friends that just did stuff and had fun and raised funds. The moment that I realised that this was actually something pretty massive, as I thought, was in January this year when I stepped off the plane in New York City with four of our voluntary team members. We were there on invitation from the Somali Mom Foundation, whose headquarters are based in New York, and we were there to negotiate the terms of Project Futures going global with our first program happening in New York City. Because Somali and Bill Livermore, who was the CEO at the time, had seen Project Futures and our sort of model for youth engagement when they were in Sydney um, to, uh, sorry, a year and a half ago, and they saw that it was working. Young professionals sort of leading the way to do things that we do every day but making a difference ultimately in some of the poorest places in the world. And the best experience in New York was not going to see a Knicks game at Madison Square Garden, even though that was pretty awesome, or even downing my first three chilli dogs. Those weren't the best experiences. The best experience was going into a the boardroom of the Somali Mind Foundation headquarters and meeting the other dynamic young professionals that volunteered their time, skills and talents in New York for the Somali Mind Foundation. It was like looking into a mirror. 
we were so excited. There was no sort of like, I know it's American and Australian, but you know, there was no sort of culture differences. We were looking at each other going, yes, we understand what you guys have been trying to do. We have too. And coming together in that boardroom, you know, we could have strolled in there making demands, kind of going, we know all the answers. We're going to tell you what to do. But instead, we didn't do that. We sat down, we listened to each other, we worked as a team, and we came up with a game plan of what Project Futures was going to look like on a global level because we wanted to inspire so many more young people as we had been. For the first time, sort of, since starting Project Futures two years ago, I realised that my one decision to sort of get up and do something two years ago in January this year, it just really made me realise and see sort of the, cap the capacity or the sort of um, uh, the vision of what we wanted to do. We were going to put it on a global platform. It was really exciting. And I leave culture eats strategy for breakfast. We went there to devise a strategic plan for New York City, for Project Futures New York City. We were there to instill a culture and our ethos of what Project Futures is about. And I believe that's all about an attitude of gratitude and an attitude of giving. And so we coined the term Gen Fs in that boardroom. We're like, we're going to make this cool trendy term. It's going to be called Gen Fs. And it stands for Generation Futures. And I believe every single one of you in this room a, can be part of Generation Futures if you choose to be. Because there's Gen Ys, Gen Xs and Baby Boomers who are all grouped according to what year you were born and what age you are. Gen Fs surpass age boundaries. We are based around mutual passion, responsibility, authenticity and challenging yesterday's way of everything. We want to do what is meaningful, ethical and we want to have fun in the process. And Gen Fs don't wait for something to fall on their lap because just as easily as it comes, it will just as easily be taken away. And so this term, I believe, is what our whole network at Project Futures is all about. And so, sort of that, at that point, when we started laughing about this whole idea of Gen Fs, at that point, I kind of um, thought to myself that there was that one moment where I kind of, everything got very clear. And I kind of thought to myself, wow, this is really something. And all of those sort of knockbacks that I got, all the criticism, all of the sort of late nights and early mornings, all of the after hours meetings and weekend board stuff, it all just floated away. And even this wrinkle line on my forehead that I totally didn't have a year ago, it just floated, it just floated away. Because I knew that that one decision that I had made in two years time, we were gonna put that on a global platform that will hopefully touch so many more young people than we could have just done in Australia and hopefully help them unlock and find their potential. Why wait for something tomorrow when you can do it today? Now my last story is about a beautiful 16 year old girl called Lithia and her story is the most powerful of all because when you hear it your excuses mean absolutely nothing and I hope that her story will empower you to go out there and find whatever it is you're passionate about whatever that may be. You heard some amazing speakers today and they all have amazing projects doing good. Find what it is that you're passionate about that wants to make you sort of shout out from the rooftops and tell all your friends about it until sort of they go, okay, here go, just take $10, you know? So Lithia was sold by her auntie into a brothel when she was 10 years old. The man that stole her virginity locked her in a room and mistreated her for one week. And from there she was sold from brothel to brothel to brothel from Vietnam where she's from, all the way to Cambodia where she ended up. Lithia is a lucky girl. She was rescued by the Somali Mom Foundation and the local police when they raided the brothel that she was in and she was saved. And she's since been in Somalia's care for the last three years. Now I met Lithia, sorry, I met Lithia two years ago when I first went to Cambodia. And she was really shy and standoffish, but she obviously had this beautiful smile and she was very mature above her years. Like I could just feel this presence about her that really drew me to her. And I went up and started chatting to her as you do. And I asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up. And she said she wanted to be a journalist. And I asked her why she, well, I said, why? Why a journalist? Do you love writing stories? And she goes, yeah, I do. She goes, I want to write about my story because I know what happened to me was wrong and I want people to know that, that that's normal. I want victims that come into this uh, rehabilitation centre to understand that what they did or what people did to them was wrong and, and it just wasn't the right thing to do. 
And I was very shocked sort of by her answer at first, this coming from sort of a, a 15 year old girl. And I didn't know what, obviously I knew what her background would have been, but I didn't know her personal story. I just started speaking to her. So I just said to her, you know, you can do it. You can be a journalist. You just have to study hard, you know, continue doing school and, and you can do it. Now, I thought about Lithia a lot when I came back um, from Cambodia and we went back to Cambodia again about six to eight months later and you know I asked her how her schooling was going and I remember her ex the excitement, the absolute excitement on her face when I went to her and I said, hey we just sort of set up our own new website, our new website's just been set up, do you want to write your first story and do you want to publish it on our website and you can share it with your friends around the world and especially your friends in Australia. She was so excited that night. We were having like this dance party with all the girls because they absolutely love to dance. And she's like so excited. She runs into her and we don't see her that night. The next day, she presents to me three double-sided pages that she'd written of beautiful Khmer script. And obviously, I couldn't understand what it said, but she goes, this is my story. This is what I publish on, what I want to publish on your website. And so we got it translated when I got back to Australia and I, we realised that Lithia really did want to tell her story. And you can read Lithia's sort of version of her life story on our website today. And one of the things that I could understand was those four beautiful words tagged in English on the end of the paper. And that was, the life is love. The life is love a quote by Lithia and a quote by a little girl that had every single reason in the world to believe that love could never exist. The life is love. And I think that the beauty about Lithia is she made a decision. She made a decision to not make her past equal her future. She made a decision to take the opportunities that had been presented to her by Somali and the great work that they do over in Cambodia. And she made a decision not to be angry at the world. She made a decision to help people and she made a decision to tell her story so that she could be the example and she could be living proof that anything is possible. And the power of making the right choices and the right decisions, although lies with each and every one of you and each and every one of you alone to make, will result in the effects that will be felt for generations to come. The life is love and I believe you're all capable of living really extraordinary lives but if you allow your decisions to serve others then I think the world would be a pretty good place sooner rather than later. Thank you so much.